Hey, you know this meme? Let's run it into the ground. So unfortunately, my boy Maury couldn't be here today. He's attending to some very important matters at the local Waffle House. Good news is my first name also starts with the letter M. We don't have to change any branding or anything. We'll just call this uh, Maury with Marcel. So not only do we maybe not really skirt any copyright issues, but we also follow, much more importantly, lessons with Marcel naming protocol. We actually have a wonderful show for you today. See, in recent years, members of the bluegrass community have struggled to answer the question, who is the father of bluegrass? Now, on one hand, we have the trad chads who say Bill Monroe is the father of bluegrass, always has been, always will be. On the other hand, there are a lot of modern day bluegrass listeners that aren't so sure. They say Earl Scruggs is the true father of bluegrass and should be honored as such. Stay with us here on the Maury with Marcel show for the next half hour or maybe like 10 minutes and we'll get to the bottom of this mystery and find out who is the father of bluegrass. This episode of the Maury with Marcel show is sponsored by the Lessons with Marcel merch store. Get cool shirts like this ain't no part of an ain't no part of nothing party like a part of nothing because an ain't no part of nothing party ain't no part shirt and more cool hats and mugs. Back to your regularly scheduled program. This feud has been bubbling under the surface for some time, but recently reached the mainstream bluegrass population with a few articles that were published in 2020 by online publication Bluegrass Today. One article by David Morris, former political reporter who asserts that Earl Scruggs is the true father. And one article by Bill Monroe biographer Richard D. Smith, who asserts that Bill Monroe is the father. Now we've wired both authors up to a lie detector to determine who is telling the truth. No, both authors were unfortunately unavailable to comment. Not that I asked them to comment, I certainly didn't. So instead we will summarize some of the points made by them. First, let's hear from David Morris and the Earl Scruggs is the father crew. In his Bluegrass Today article, Morris quotes the historical marker in front of the famous Ryman Auditorium. In December 1945, Grand Ole Opry star Bill Monroe and his mandolin brought to the Ryman Auditorium stage a band that created a new American musical form. This ensemble became known as the original Bluegrass Band. So if the band created a new American musical form, who was responsible? It was a great lineup with Monroe, Flat, Chubby Wise, and Howard Watts, AKA Cedric Rainwater, but they had all been in the band previously. The only new part of the equation was the banjo man whose three finger style set the music world on fire. A solid point, the birth year of Bluegrass is widely agreed upon as the day Earl Scruggs joined the group and debuted on the Grand Ole Opry. Now, if Bill Monroe is the father, surely we should celebrate the year his backing band, the Bluegrass Boys, were founded. Morris goes on to quote Steve Martin, adding his own commentary afterwards. In a celebrated 2012 essay in The New Yorker, Steve Martin noted, few players have changed the way we hear an instrument the way Earl Scruggs has, putting him in a category with Miles Davis, Louis Armstrong, Chet Atkins, and Jimi Hendrix. Of course, virtuosity does not equal paternity. Morris has conceded here that simply being a highly influential player does not equal paternity. This is an interesting concession because the majority of arguments from the Earl is the father side hinge on the fact that the birth of bluegrass is dated to Earl's debut as a bluegrass boy. That isn't the only argument from this side of the fence though. There are many anecdotal points and thought experiments that are concerning when it comes to the case of paternity. One point that I've heard echoed by many is the simple fact that if you went out on the street and asked people to name a bluegrass musician, well, you'd get a lot of weird answers uh, and probably some Billy String shout outs, but you would hear the name Earl Scruggs long before you ever heard the name Bill Monroe from the public. This is an interesting point, but we're talking about paternity, not name recognition. Another concerning fact is that the most recognizable sound in bluegrass is the five string banjo, specifically Scruggs style. Maybe that's up for debate, but once again, if you were asking folks on the street to name a bluegrass instrument, 
I think the most common instrument you would hear people name would be banjo, and you know that they mean Scruggs style. So that's an interesting point as well, but in Morris's words, virtuosity does not equal paternity. To me, paternity implies an influence over the genre as a whole. So for instance, Flat and Scruggs did feature Dobro in their lineup, which Bill and Earl famously didn't agree with. Flat and Scruggs also featured lead guitar, albeit Scruggs style. Bill Monroe never featured guitar players in that way. To me, those are much stronger points in favor of paternity, but I don't know whether to attribute those to the group or to just Earl Scruggs himself. I don't know if he made those decisions, uh, however, in Bill Monroe's band, I do know that Bill made those decisions. In any case, let's hear what Richard D. Smith has to say on the matter. Smith states in his article, There's no denying that the Bluegrass Boys band circa 1945 to 1948 was very special. Not only was Bill's mandolin and vocal genius superbly supported by future musical partners Lester and Earl, Chubby Wise's soulful fiddling also came to influential prominence in that lineup, a bluegrass supergroup if ever there was one. But I believe this band, and Earl Scruggs' role in it, is really a direct continuation of Monroe's creative work since the 1938 breakup of the Monroe Brothers, his popular duo with singer-guitarist Charlie Monroe. This is possibly the crux of the matter. Bill Monroe had a guiding hand on the genre, and of course, the genre is named after his band, the band he hired and led. Let's hear further evidence from Ralph Rinsler by way of Richard D. Smith. The one thing he was extremely aware of was that he had fashioned his music. His music didn't happen and it wasn't intuitive. He consciously did it, the way a painter takes his brush and dips his brush into different colors on that palette. He can tell you exactly where he got every sound in his music. So the assertion from the Bill Monroe crowd is not that he is the most famous bluegrass musician or that he personally played the most influential sounds, but that the performers he hired and the groups he presented are his creation. He served as quite literally a patriarch to the genre in its formative years. I feel like it's hasty to give the trophy to Earl Scruggs. It sounds good, but as Richard D. Smith says in the late 1930s, Bill Monroe was already hiring singers like Cleo Davis because they had the same vocal presentation as his brother Charlie. He was hiring fiddlers like Art Wooten and then coaching them for hours so they nailed the bluegrass sound which was undeniably influenced by Bill's Uncle Penn. Even the structure of the bluegrass break. A kickoff phrase, melody, then at the halfway point some kind of G-run or G-run equivalent followed by kickoff, melody, G-run equivalent at the end. It's split into two sections of melody, the G-runs and the kickoffs, showing the beginning and end of both those sections. Now, fiddler Howdy Forrester is sometimes credited as the first one to really structure, really clearly structure his bluegrass breaks in that way. So the essential elements are not necessarily things that Bill Monroe himself invented, but Bill was impressed by advancements like these, and he would purposefully hire those people, assemble people that regularly used groundbreaking techniques, not only to showcase their talents, but to educate his own band on the latest and greatest methods. I suppose what we really have is a problem of definition. Now, I talked to a friend of the show, Hayes Griffin, and he summed up this problem really nicely by saying, what is our definition of paternity? Are we looking for who played the sounds or who put the sounds together? I think this commentary actually gets us closer to a real answer. If we're looking for people that played the sounds, Bluegrass has a lot of dads. There's a lot of names on that list. Would Earl Scruggs' name be the biggest on that list? Possibly. Flatten Scruggs toured colleges in the 60s, introducing Bluegrass to a new generation. They lined themselves up for work in TV and film while Bill was still interested in radio. I mean, yeah, they did a lot to like really put their names out there. So one of the most influential bluegrass musicians with a great personality, presence, technical ability on his instrument and a business acumen that might have actually saved the business of bluegrass. That's definitely Earl Scruggs. But with a keen ear and a vision for the future of his music that he made very clear in who he hired for his band, and even though he underpaid performers, fathered multiple illegitimate children, and allegedly beat his wife with the Bible, I have to say it, Bill Monroe, you are the father.
doesn't feel as good as I thought it would feel. Uh, it's hard to be Mori. If you'd like to see more Mori with Marcel, watch this video again. It's literally the only time I'm gonna have an excuse to do this. Remember to check out LessonsWithMarcel.com for all of your bluegrass guitar needs and for a little bit of mandolin as well. Y'all have a good one.